as I said earlier, um, there's, a, there's a difficulty in this because giving 1,500 years of teaching, in, you know, teaching about 1,500 years in 15 hours, 100 years an hour is a little much. Even to hit the high points is difficult. And so several times I've kind of skipped over stuff and I said, okay, I'll pick that up next week. A few times I had, I moved Gregory the Great. I said I was going to hit the Scholastics last week and I didn't. In fact, I'm not going to hit them this time either, okay? Um, other than to say, Anselmo Canterbury and Thomas Aquinas. Now you know what you need to know about the Scholastics. <laughs> uh, those are the two most important ones. But, uh, who's, the, who's the first one? Anselmo of Canterbury. Um, Anselm and, and Thomas Aquinas were two, and that, actually Anselm was a precursor, he was a pre-scholastic. The scholastics were called the schoolmen, they grew up in the great universities uh, of the, the Middle Ages. But Anselm and Thomas Aquinas, big focus on rationality, they're the ones that created the arguments for the existence of God. Okay. Uh, Thomas Aquinas had five of them. Anselm sort of started it with what's called the ontological argument. You heard that one? Ontological means being, you know, to, to exist. And Anselm's ontological argument was that um, God is the being that is conceived of as being more perfect than anything else, right? You know, God is the perfect being. Well, by definition, a being that really exists is more perfect than a being that doesn't exist. So therefore, the very fact that we can conceive of a perfect being means God must exist. That's the ontological argument of Anselm. I said I wasn't going to teach you about the Scholastics. <laughs> so go, go study the Scholastics, because we're not going to get to that. There are a number of other things that I would like to have gotten to and haven't. But if you, look, if you, if you go on and uh, say, look up logical proofs of God, you'll get Anselm of Canterbury and you'll get Thomas Aquinas. And in fact, uh, Bob Plenty, you like um, G.K. Chesterton? He wrote a biography of Thomas Aquinas called The Dumb Ox. Um, because when, when Aquinas was a student, he was a great big guy and he was really quiet. And his other students called him the dumb ox. Well, Anselm, who was his professor, said, that dumb ox will shake the world. Oh. And he did. Aquinas is one of the most significant theologians and philosophers ever. Very Catholic, you know, more so than we would care for, but still very significant. Okay? So, today... Uh, we're going to deal with a few high points in the next hour to just catch us up. And some of the things I'm going to talk about today are things that you probably would wonder about, even though um, at least one of them, the Inquisition, is actually not a major theme in the history of the church. You'll notice that in your book, it probably had a couple of pages on it. The other book, the Gonzalez book that I'm using as sort of an additional reference for my preparation, barely mentions it at all. So even though the Inquisition is a major, you know, people think of it as being a big deal, in terms of the overall history of the church, it's not that big a deal. But we will talk about it today because people have questions about it. We will talk about the two great schisms. There are two events in the history of the church, both of them, well, between 1000 and 1400, um, two major events which both have been called the Great Schism. For clarity, one of them is often now referred to as the Western Schism, but there are two major events. We'll talk about those, the Inquisition, and then the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Babylonian captivity does not, in this case, mean when the Jews were conquered by Babylon and taken off into exile. The quote-unquote Babylonian captivity of the church, or of the papacy, happened, it was the French fault, the French king's fault. Okay, we'll talk about that. Um, in fact, let's talk about that right now. The first great schism existed that occurred was between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Well, we, we're, not, we're not talking about it again right now. We're talking about the, the, the East-West schism, great schism. The fact is that by the 11th century, that is the 1000s, the Eastern Church under the Patriarch of Constantinople, and Constantinople is such a long word, I used, I often abbreviated it here, Constant, Constant period, okay? Um, the Patriarch of Constantinople, think of him as the Pope, okay? The, the first five major episcopacies of the church, which were called Patriarchies, or, and is sometimes referred to as the Pentarchy. It was Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome, okay? Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome, and not necessarily in that order. They're in that order somewhat um, chronologically, but not in terms of importance. We'll talk about that. By the 11th century, 
The head of the Patriarchy of Constantinople, the Patriarch, also called the Metropolitan, um, and the, the Western Church under the Pope in Rome, Bishop of Rome, who's called the Pope, his formal title is the Bishop of Rome, they, there were a lot of differences between these Eastern and Western churches. They were linguistic, cultural, doctrinal, ecclesiastical, political, geographical, obviously they were in different places. Um, and so I want to spend some time, and this led to the split that created the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. So this first great schism, which really happened over hundreds of years, but we identify 1054 as, the, as, as sort of the, the center point. Things happened before that, things happened after that, but that was sort of the point at which everybody was excommunicating everybody else, where we, where we define it as being the official day. Okay, so let's talk about that. First, uh, Eastern Church, Western Church. Eastern Church is Greek-speaking. They're in Constantinople. They speak Greek. Their services are in Greek. I mean, think about the Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox churches today. It's very similar. In the West, they spoke Latin because it was Rome. East based in Constantinople, West in Rome. They had had um, a real conflict because of the move of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. Obviously, the Roman Empire started where? Rome. 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 And yet, later on, especially when Constantine, well, Diocletian split the empire in two, and so it ended up with two capitals, Rome and a capital in the east, which actually was in Constantinople originally. But then shortly after that, Constantine came along, defeated all the other sub-emperors, became the emperor, and he created his capital, in Nova Roma. Nova Roma means New Rome. He called it New Rome. Later on, it started being called Constantinople because it was the city of Constantine. So you got the old capital was Rome. The new capital was in Constantinople. The Roman Empire, because that was, you know, this was, you know, the, the Christianity was the became the religion of the Roman Empire. Some people felt like that the old capital, Rome, was the most important. Other people said the emperor has moved to Constantinople. That's the new Rome. That's where the center is now. So there's this geographical confusion. Which is more important, the old, old capital or the new capital? Um, then you get a number of controversies going back as far as 180 AD. All right? This is long before Christianity was legal. They have what's called the Quarto de, de Simon. I can't even pronounce it. Quarto de Simon. Controversy. What that meant was the Pope in Rome at that point, they were trying to figure out when is Easter? Now, Easter is linked to the lunar calendar of the Jewish people, which determines when, when Passover is, right? Easter happened at Passover. Well, the question was do we celebrate it on the exact day that occurs in the lunar calendar, which could actually come in the middle of the week? Or do we celebrate it on the Sunday following that? Does that sound like a big deal to you? <laughs> well, it was a big deal to them in the 180s. In fact, the Pope in Rome declared, we, we celebrate Easter on the Sunday after the Jewish Passover. And people in the Eastern Church said, oh, we don't like that. We'd rather stick with the cap. And the Pope said, then you're excommunicated. <laughs> and so he's excommunicating people because they wouldn't agree that Easter should be on the Sunday after Passover. And everybody in the East is going, oh, come on. You need a hobby. Excommunicating people? Because, they, you know, this is not a big deal. But still, this caused one of the first of the theological differences that caused a rift between the East and the West. Because in the West, everybody was okay with it. It was only in the East that people didn't want to agree with the Pope in Rome. Then we get several other controversies, like the controversy of the Filioque. I think I've, I've explained that to you, right? In the Nicene Creed, it says... And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Right? Sound familiar? The last part of that, and the Son, literally, is filioque. The Nicene Creed had come from Nicaea, which is very near Const Constantinople. When they started using it in the West, they had a slightly different theological understanding of the nature of the Holy Spirit, and they added the expression... In the, the original Nicene Creed said, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Full stop. In Rome, they changed it, and they added from the Father and the Son. And in the East, they said, no, he doesn't. 
You're wrong. They practically went to war over that filioque and the son. Some people say that was almost the last theological straw between the two. They also had the difference in iconography. In the East, they promoted the use of icons as a way to focus worship. In the West, they decided that they, those were um, uh, idols. And it went back and forth. Ultimately, they settled on the fact that in the East, they're considered a critically important part of focusing people in worship. In the West, they don't really use them. And you know about the, sort of the, the Byzantine icons, the, the Russian Orthodox icons, beautiful things. In fact, there are schools that teach just that, how to create icons. And it's a spiritual exercise. It's not just, it's not just learning to paint. Big theological difference between the East and the West there. So there were a number of different issues, which to them were huge deals. And they sort of added up. Then you get the fact that Rome, the Western Church, claimed their authority came from St. Peter, who had been the Bishop of Rome. Now, the Catholic Church claims that. Some historians deny that, but it is true. Peter came to Rome, and he was, he was executed there. We accept that. But because he was the rock on which Jesus said, I will build my church, then Rome claims that since he was the Bishop of Rome, then Rome has authority. And Rome says, well, we were founded, you know, the, the Church of Rome was founded by the first of the apostles, the leader of the apostles, Peter. So that makes us king. <laughs> you know, I mean, that makes the, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, the number one, the, the, the we, we call him the primate, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the idea of him being the, the number one guy, having primacy, first place. So the... The struggle that they had with that, the Council of Nicaea in the 300s, when they met, they decided that of the Pentarchy, the five major cities that were Roman, uh, that were sees in the, in, the, in the church, that Rome would be first because of Peter and because it had been the original head of the, of the empire, the, the, the eternal city. And then below that would be Antioch and Alexandria, who also claimed to have been founded by apostles. Jerusalem was given sort of an honorary place because that's where the church started. Uh, but it wasn't that big. It wasn't that important in terms of the, you know, the whole empire. And then Constantinople, who does not, who, which did not have a claim to any sort of apostolic founding. You know, there was, there was a patriarchy there because Constantine, the emperor, decided to make that his new Rome. But it wasn't linked to any apostles or anything. So that was the order. Rome then Antioch and Alexandria, then Jerusalem honorarily, and then Constantinople. Well, the thing was, the whole issue of this is the new Rome, this is the new head, this is the, the, the emperor who has made Christianity legal, Constantine, made this his new headquarters. So, the second, you know, Council of Nicaea was the first ecumenical council. The second ecumenical council in 381 was held in Constantinople, the Council of Constantinople. They decided that Constantinople was equal to Rome in terms of being the first two most important patriarchies because it was now the seat of the empire. And so much was happening from there. Okay? Do you begin to see how this kind of division was working its way up? Then, in 1053, over various other kinds of controversies, especially differences in theology, the Patriarch of uh, Constantinople closes all of the Latin, that is, because there were Latin churches in Constantinople. There were sort of Roman Catholic, if you will, churches in Constantinople. He closes them over theological differences. The next year, 1054, Pope Leo sends delegates, papal legates, they're called, to Constantinople to straighten out this problem. Well, unfortunately, one of the people he sent, um, who was... A cardinal, Umberto, didn't speak Greek, didn't want to speak Greek, didn't like Greek people, didn't like Constantinople, didn't like anything that wasn't in Rome. So they get there, and he's really having trouble with all this stuff. They, uh, they go there, to, and they quote from a document called the Donation of Constantine, which they had in Rome, which they said, and we know now this was a forgery. We think the Pope, Pope Leo really believed it at the time. We don't think he was intentionally lying. But this document, called the Donation of Constantine, supposedly was written by Constantine, or by his people, saying that Constantine himself believed that Rome should be the first of the patriarchies. So Pope Leo sends his legates, including, you know, uh, this, this very difficult to get along with cardinal, 
to Constantinople to, to confront the patriarch, Michael, in Constantinople and say, no, 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 you guys have to do what we say. Because even Constantine said Rome came first. Well, Michael says, not hardly. The patriarch says, not hardly. And so Berto walks into the Hagia Sophia, which is the number one, you know, that was the center of the Eastern Church, the big church there, walks up to the altar in the middle of Mass and slaps this document of excommunication down on the altar, excommunicating the Patriarch Michael, Cyrillus, uh, and marches out and heads back to Rome. Well, by the way, by the time he did that, Pope Leo died while they were en route, so they really didn't have any authority. The Pope that they, they were under orders from, that they were speaking for, was no longer alive. Anyway, so the Patriarch turns around and does, guess what? excommunicates all those gods, all right? So you've got the Pope excommunicating, or the representatives of the Pope, actually, the cardinals, uh, excommunicating the patriarch, the patriarch excommunicating those papal legates. The reason why this is in color, 1054, is because of that mutual excommunication thing going on, that's usually the date that they, they say, they have to pick a date and say, when did this happen? Well, that's the best date because that's what everybody's excommunicating everybody. 1054. But that wasn't the end of it. The hope was from that point, you know, re after that, that they'd figure out some way to get back together. And they struggled and there were more problems and, you know, they never could quite get, you know, straightened out to be one church again because there were a lot of people who said, we really need to be one church. You know, we're the church of Jesus Christ. Well, then there are political, or I'm sorry, commercial things that come into this. In 1182, there's a thing in Constantinople called the Massacre of the Latins. The emperor in the east at that point had been Manuel I. Manuel I's wife was a woman named Maria of Antioch. She was from Antioch in Syria, but she loved Western things. She loved Latin. She loved the Roman history. She loved all that stuff. Well, Manuel I died, and his wife, Maria, is convinced by some Western commercial interests to give precedence to these Latin-speaking Western merchants. And so she makes all kinds of concessions. They don't have to pay taxes. They have extra rights when it comes to import. All sorts of other benefits. And it really ticks everybody else off. That this queen, who's, you know, who they think of as a foreigner, whose husband has died, she now is giving all of this benefit. Well, at some point, it finally breaks. In 1182, there are riots. And 60,000 Latin-speaking Westerners are either killed or flee the city. I mean, they didn't kill 60,000, but there were 60,000 residents at that time. A lot of them were killed. The rest of them were driven off. This was called the Massacre of the Latins. And again, this is a reflection of the fact there's such hard feelings between the Greek-speaking Easterners and the Latin-speaking Westerners. Well, um, partly in response to that kind of thing, partly for economic reasons, this is the time of the Crusades, remember? Well, First Crusade, Second Crusade, Third Crusade, Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade, these Western knights get together. They want to go to the Holy Land. They don't want to have to walk. Long way. So they go to Venice and say, would you take us there in your nice little boats? Because Venice was the sailing, you know, they were their own kingdom, the kingdom of Venice. They had all these ships. And they said, well, we'll take you, but you, you don't have the money to pay us because this is expensive. So, tell you what, you've got all these men at arms, why don't you take over this city for us? And, you know, because we, we like that city, we want all the money out of it. So they conquered a city, and then the Venetians said, well, that's not enough, you still have enough. So we'll take you to Constantinople, but we want Constantinople. So they took this Western armies by boat to Constantinople, and they sacked Constantinople. They opened the doors and let them in, thinking they're on the same side. You know, we're all Christians, and we're... Trying, the Crusades are to fight against the Muslims. They let them in. They sacked the city. And so, in 1204, Constantinople is sacked in the Fourth Crusade. It creates what's called the Latin Empire of Constantinople, which lasts until 1261. For over 50 years, Latin Westerners controlled the city of Constantinople. They do away with the Greek. Uh, services in the Hagia Sophia. They have Latin services. It's, you know, it's practically war. And that, that and some other things that happened during the Crusades weakened Constantinople and undoubtedly contribute to the fact that eventually they were conquered by the Muslims. Partly because they were weakened by other Christians. Okay. Then, 
you get into the, the political realities. We've talked about the fact that there was always a conflict in the West, and we'll, we'll get into details about that in a minute, between the Pope and the various monarchs in the West, whoever was king, whoever the most powerful king was. Well, that got worse as we went along, but the fact is, when the, when the empire fell apart in the West, Western Europe, and they were just the barbarian kingdoms, when there was not a central emperor in the West, the Pope became more powerful. The Pope in Rome. On the other hand, in the East, because that was where there was an emperor, and the emperor continued until the 1400s, because the emperor was strong, the patriarch was weak. So you had weak political leadership and strong Pope in the West. You had strong political leadership and weak patriarch in the East, which is one of the reasons that the Pope in Rome was always pushing. And I mean, every Pope that came along would write some document, some papal bull or whatever, declaring that they were the leader of the whole Christian world and that anybody who didn't recognize that was, was liable to be excommunicated. And they did it specifically, you know, poking their finger in the nose of the patriarch of Constantinople. Down to the point where you get people like um, Innocent III who said, he was the mediator between God and man, that he was more than human, that he was, you know, missing the fact that Scripture says there is one God, one mediator between God and man, who is Christ Jesus. The popes were saying, you cannot be saved without me. You cannot be a church without me. You cannot be in any way reconciled to God without me, the pope. And you can go on and on. The statements that came out of those people, you're thinking, are you listening to yourself? But that happened over and over and over and over again because of these reasons. Claiming they had the right to do that because of Peter being the Bishop of Rome, because that was the place where the empire started, etc., etc., etc. So this created the split, which was, or schism, schism is the word that means split, the great schism between what became the Roman Catholic Church, Rome, and the Orthodox churches of the East, Eastern Orthodoxy, they letters later split up, just like, just like Roman Catholicism split up, and they're, you know, they're to, there's the Protestant Reformation that split off and everything else. In the East, they have Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, you know, etc., and some other splendor groups. But that's where the Great Split came, and that's why. And there have been efforts to reconcile pretty much twice a year since then. There are always efforts going on to try to reconcile those two, and yet. In every case, and this happened as recently as, you know, the, the Pope Benedict, who was Cardinal Ratzinger, who was in charge of the, basically, the Congregation of the Faith, which we're going to talk about in a while. It's the Inquisition he was in charge of. Um, his responsibility was maintaining the, the doctrine of the church, maintaining the purity of the doctrine. Every effort was made as recently as right before uh, Pope Benedict became Pope, when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, they, they said, yes, we would love to reconcile with you, Eastern Orthodox Church. All you have to do is acknowledge the primacy of, of the Pope, that the, the Bishop of Rome is first and foremost. And then there's some other things you need to do or stop doing, too, theologically. Um, and, and, and the East says, that's the one thing we're not going to do. And they go, well, that's your fault. Everybody says it's their fault because they won't, they won't do this stuff, okay? So that's the great split, the great schism between East and West. Questions about that? Who is the present uh, patriarch of the East? I have no idea. <laughs> Nicholas something, I think. I don't and does, know. And does the attitude that you described about the Pope, uh, him being uh, the mediator, does, did that, did that uh, pass on to the current? Uh, they don't talk about it much, but it is the, technically the official, well, not, not to the extent of saying that they are more than human, which is what some of the popes actually said, not to the extent of saying, um, you know, I'm the mediator between God and man, but they do maintain that uh, the, the formal doctrine of the church, and I say formal doctrine because the Second Vatican Council changed this a little bit. The Second Vatican Council called by John the Twenty-Third. by the way, he's the third one called John the Twenty-Third. and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, the Second Vatican Council, they actually, for the first time, officially said out of that council that somebody can be a Christian, be saved, and not be a Catholic. The Second Vatican Council described Protestant believers in Jesus as being separated brethren. Meaning we are brothers in Christ, but we are separated from the true church. 
Now understand that through most of the history of the church, the doctrine has been what uh, you know, what previously, what was stated by the early church fathers, and that is a person cannot have God as their father who does not have the church as their mother. That has traditionally been the understanding. Um, and technically, I think it still is today, although Second Vatican Council softened that. And the Second Vatican Council was so hard for some people to, to take that there were splits off the Catholic Church because of it, because of exactly what I just said. In fact, uh, I met some nuns once who belonged to an order that in Latin, the order means the, the order of the open chair. And the reason is because they believe John, from John the 23rd on, John the 23rd was a heretic, they believe, because he said that you didn't have to be Catholic to be saved. And so from that point on, there has not been a legitimate pope. The chair of the pope, you know, the pope speaks ex cathedra, which literally means from the chair. Uh, by the way, that's what cathedral means. It means the chair, the chair of the, of the bishop. Um, that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it means from his chair. And so they're called the Order of the Empty Chair because they believe that from John the 23rd on, there has not been a legitimate Pope. Because they disagreed so much with that doctrine. That, the, several doctrines, but that's one of them. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I don't know nearly as much about the Orthodox Church, to be honest with you. And so um, I know they've never been as adamant about stuff as the Catholic Church has. Um, any, anything else about that? And yes. Just filioque. Was that later? Like, like, what was the date of that? Do you know? I mean, well, is that still pretty early, or is that later on? Pretty um, it's pretty early. It's quite early. Um, there were actually some Frankish missionaries. Meaning, this was when they were still in the barbarian period. So it was probably 600s, 700s. You know, when when uh, the Frankish kingdom was because it was still a Frankish kingdom. It was not yet Charlemagne had not combined them yet at 800. Um, that those missionaries went to Constantinople, and they, they were missionaries to the Slavs and some other areas, but when they came to Constantinople, and they're participating as Christians in the services, they were, they were saying, proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the Greek folks in Constantinople went nuts over this. So I know it goes back at least 600, 700 in there. There's, did, there's did an exact date. Didn't you say which creed it was? Nicene. Nicene. Well, yeah. that's... Well, but it wasn't in the original Nicene Creed. Oh, okay. The Western Church added it later. Oh. The Nicene Creed is from the three, from 320-ish, 325, I think. Uh, the, 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 we think of councils meeting like, okay, we're going to get together for a week. Some of these councils met for a decade. Yeah. You know, um, the, the, There were a few short ones that met for, for shorter times, but typically they would meet for a year. You know, oh. A lot of stuff to do. Um, and so, but the early 300s, the, the, the Nicene Creed, that's why, and it came from Nicaea, right near Constantinople. It was an Eastern creed. And the fact that the Westerners had added something to it without asking permission made them crazy. Okay, Kenneth? When Pope John Paul was alive, he made contact with the Eastern Orthodox Church. And I remember reading at that time that whatever he did, if he went there or what, it was the first time that a pope had done that. Right, first visit. The original, uh, Yep. And people said, this is just a great gesture. This is wonderful. We ought to get together. And they came back and said, you know, what would it take for us to get together? And they said, well, you have to declare that the Pope in Rome is the number one. And they went, oh, come on. You know? um, I'm giving you sort of my editorial views of this stuff. So, but you get the idea, all right? Okay, let's talk about the next theme for today, and that is the Inquisition. Um, in the 12th century, especially, of the 1100s, there was a growth of perceived heresies, notably uh, Catharism, or the Cathars, it's also called Albigensianism, because it was centered around the southern French town of Albi. Um, it basically is, is Gnosticism or Manichaeism. Dualism, you know, there's the power of good and evil, light and dark is equal, the, the physical body is bad, the spiritual world is good. Um, and now it claimed to be Christian, as did you know Gnostic, early Gnosticism. But it, it started growing as a as a movement, especially in southern France. Um, one of the I remember one of the Three Musketeers movies. There's a scene where they're they're bombarding this fortress, okay, and, and the Musketeers are running around from in, in the line of fire and everything, trading flasks of wine, you know, and like oh I, you know I want something to eat oh. Uh, and this is a Cathar fortress in southern France, because that's the same time period. And there, 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 was, a, there was a crusade in Western Europe to destroy this heresy. Okay. Well, it had grown. There also was a growth of what's called the Waldensian movement, a guy named Peter Waldo. 
um, and others. Now, this same movement produced Franciscan <coughs> monks. So there were some parts of this poor movement, meaning a denial of all material wealth. It was an effort to get back to the true faith. Franciscan movement and some others were accepted as being legitimate. Some of them, like the Waldensians and the uh, Fraticelli, the, small, the Little Brothers, uh, which was another movement, they were declared heresies, mostly because they were so critical. The Waldensians not only said, we need to renounce the world and renounce material goods and live poor and preach, their two big things were no material possessions, and preach the way Jesus preached, by going from town to town, being supported by the local people wherever you went, and preaching the gospel. Sounds good. Well, along the way, they also said, and by the way, the Pope is the Antichrist, the Catholic Church is evil, you can't listen to them, they, they don't do anything good. Well, so the Waldensians, who were sort of the first Protestant, some of the, well, some of the first Protestants, if you will, because later on, they became Protestants, the ones that survived, because they were persecuted pretty heavily and kind of ran into the mountains and woods. Later on, when the Protestant Reformation came along, they celebrated that, and many of them joined the Reform Movement. They became Presbyterians, basically, uh, because it was very consistent with what, what was being said by the Reformation. But in the 12th century, there was a, a sense of a lot of perceived heresies. And at that point, Pope Lucian III, in 1184, he ordered all the bishops to inquire or to perform an inquest as to whether or not the faith of their people was correct or not, or whether some of their people might be heretics. That inquiry or inquest became the Inquisition. Now, in 1220, the Inquisition was, was given over to the Dominican order, which was a monastic order, the Dominicans after St. Dominic, um, and that they were a new order, and they were given whole responsibilities for this. I actually am reading a book now called 13, uh, 1326, and it has it's taken it's the battle it's the, it has to do with the wars between France and and uh, England, and there are bad cardinals and all sorts of things. And at one point, one of the cardinals is talking to somebody, and he says, "Well, I have a Dominican friend that I'm sure would like to question you about that." <laughs> Well, if you know what he was meaning, he was meaning, I will turn you over to the Inquisition for torture. Okay, because it was the Dominicans that were doing this. And in 1229, the Synod of Toulouse met, and they gave wide-ranging powers and rights to the Inquisitors to do pretty much whatever they wanted. It said they were free from any civil authority, and they reported only the Pope. Prior to that time, the bishops, the local bishops, had been over the Inquisitors, the ones who were looking into people's faiths. Now, it reported only the Pope, and it declared um, that those who were accused of heresy had very little rights. The, um, the ancient Roman law and the Napoleonic law, and by the way, the Mexican law, which is based upon Napoleonic law because those darn French controlled this country for a while, um, it says that if you're accused of a crime, you're considered guilty until found innocent. That's not what we Americans, at least, are used to, and I don't think Canadians either. But the, the Roman law, the Napoleonic law, and now Mexican law all have the premise if you're accused of a crime, you have the responsibility to prove yourself innocent. Well, that was true back then. And, and they, for instance, said that if somebody's accused of a heresy, they're to be brought forward. They, they aren't told who their accuser is. They may not even be told what they're accused of. They may not be allowed to make a defense. But if they're found guilty, they can be burned at the stake. That's why Inquisition has come to mean injustice to most people, all right? Oh, I forgot. 20, 20, 20, 20, 29, Senate of Toulouse. Then in 1252, Pope Innocent IV, don't you love that Pope Innocent is what he said is, authorized torture as a means of getting, I'm sorry, of getting torture, of getting confessions and information, I should say, from suspected heretics. Although, interestingly enough, the Inquisitors were not allowed to shed blood. They could crush all the bones in your body. They could stretch you until your spine came disjointed. But they could not shed your blood. Now, frequently what they would do is they would employ other people to shed your blood. Okay, But they couldn't do it themselves. At that same time, um, and you'll notice uh, what I have here that um, the guilty, those who found guilty of heresy, were usually, almost always, except in Spain and Portugal, were turned over to civil authorities for punishment, and that punishment often would mean burning at the stake if they were found guilty. Now, not always. 
Some of it would be banishment, some of it would be fines, depending upon the severity. Um, the, the idea we have that everybody who came under the, the concern of the Inquisition was automatically burned alive, that's not true. But it was horrible enough. Uh, they had events called the auto de fe, auto de fe, which were, it's called an act of faith, in which they would um, prosecute, you know, after prosecuting people, they would punish them, frequently burning them alive. In 1578, a handbook for inquisitors says this, Punishment does not take place primarily and per se for the correction and good of the person punished, but for the public good, in order that others may become terrified and weaned away from the evils they would commit. So one of the reasons that the things they did were so horrific is they didn't really care about the person who done something wrong. They wanted to make sure nobody else wanted to do that. And that's why they did things like burn people alive, in some cases, quite a few at once. Yes? If you go to Guanajuato, which is a Mexican center for the Inquisition, and go to that Inquisition Museum, right. you don't sleep for two minutes yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, it really is unbelievable that um, it lasted as long as it did, yeah. and that it was as like it got to this country. Well, people here didn't say, what the heck is this nonsense? Well, remember who owned this country? <coughs> you know, Spain. Yeah. Well, in the 15th century, Spain and the 16th century, Portugal launched their own inquisitions, and those were the worst, especially the Spanish. In fact, when people are referring to this, they often say the Spanish Inquisition, because that was the worst. The Spanish did not rely on civil authorities, they did their own punishing their own burning of the stake. And they launched um, two inquisitions in the New World. Okay, they, they, they one based in Mexico that was responsible for all of Mexico and Guatemala and Central America, one based in Peru that was all of the rest of Latin America. And they pursued this, okay, and it was pretty horrific. Um, the, when it came to the New World, it was looking for heresy and all kinds of other things, but particularly in the Iberian Peninsula, you will remember that the Moors, the Islamic forces, had taken over, at one point, all of Spain and Portugal. They got driven back, um, so that, and then later completely driven out. But what happened was, when the Christians reconquered the Reconquista, which means the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and Portugal, they forced the Muslims, who were still there, and the Jews, because there was a fairly large Jewish population, to convert. Well, come the Inquisition, 15th and 16th century in the Iberian Peninsula, and they decided they didn't think these people really meant it, that they were really still secretly Muslims and Jews. And so they started this persecution of the Inquisition in the Iberian Peninsula. Now think about this, they forced them to convert to Christianity, then they come back later and said they don't believe them, and so they launched the Inquisition against them. The other interesting thing is, you'll notice 15th century and 16th century, at one point the Spanish, the Inquisition, had ordered all Jews out of Spain. Well, a lot of them left Spain and went to Portugal. And 100 years later, the Inquisition comes to Portugal. So it was not a good thing. Um, in the 15th century, the German Inquisitions focused not on heresy, but on witches. This is where a lot of people think of, you know, you've seen the movies and everything where these inquisitors are after witches. And they had very weird things, you know, like the dunking booth, where they would, you know, strap a, a, an accused witch there and they would hold them underwater. And if they drowned, then they weren't really a witch. But if they didn't die, they must be a witch, so let's kill them, okay? <laughs> um, another thing they would do is they would claim that every witch would have a devil's spot meaning some place on their body that they felt no pain. And so they would take long needles and basically keep trying to find some place where they yeah. didn't experience any pain <laughs> until they found one. But what happens to somebody if you do that often enough? Yeah. This is horrible stuff. But I want to reiterate the fact that as horrible as this was, this is not a major theme in the history of the church. It was a horrible, horrible aberration. Now technically, the Inquisition lasted until the middle of the 19th century, middle of the 1800s, although after the 15th century they didn't do a lot of the torturing kind of stuff, but it still existed. In fact, in 1908, the official, uh, the Office of the Inquisition at the Vatican 
was renamed the Sacred Con Congregation of the Holy Office. Doesn't sound quite as bad as Inquisition. It got a bad name, but. Then in 1965, it was renamed the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This is what Bishop Ratzinger, or Cardinal Ratzinger, was in charge of before he became Pope. Basically, it meant they were responsible for making sure that the doctrine was clear. They dealt with people uh, who were considered, you know, Catholic writers who wrote things that were considered to be um, heretical, contrary, you know. So it wasn't so much they were going around torturing people to get them to confess, as just identifying what is and is not consistent with, Christ with Catholic doctrine. They were the ones that would give an imprimatur, it's called, where they would, they would certify that a Catholic book was consistent with Catholic doctrine according to the Vatican. But they didn't torture me. Yes, John. Ross, would you explain how how it, the conclusion is that this is not a very significant event in the history of the church when it goes for 400 years? Well, it went for 400 years. There was a very a relatively short period of time in each of these places where it was a where it was a factor. And kind of ebb and flow. Well, you, yeah, exactly. You'll notice that in the 1200s it was happening. In France, you know that's really, really where it started because the Cathars and you know others, uh, France and some some in Central Europe. Later, it moved to Spain and Portugal, and then from Spain because Spain controlled the New World at that point, New Spain it was even called. Then it came here. Later on, 15th century Germany caught on, and that was primarily about witches, you know, about the supernatural practicing the, super, the occult. Uh, but in terms of it not being, it lasted a long time, but in terms of what effect did it have on the church, it probably was not as damaging to the church as, as other unethical things that, that church authorities were doing during those times in terms of the impact that it had. I'm not saying it was okay. I'm just saying look at a book on church history and see how much focus they put on it. And that's an indication of the fact that it did not have, it's not like, the church is going along and the Inquisition happens and then history changes. It was just one of the awful things that happened in a fairly awful time in human history. Okay. Becky? How did the Pope justify this torture? Where they, did they get it that it was okay? All that? One way that it was described was that um, if, if, if the body has a rotten limb, in order for the healthy flesh to survive, the limb has to be removed. They, would, they thought the heresies were rotten, you know, a rotten part of the body of Christendom, of Christianity. And so in order for the whole body to remain healthy and to live, it was necessary to remove that. Okay? Now you can sort of understand, well, it's, it's hard to understand, I'll put that the, another way, why torture needs to be part of that, but it was. But the fact is that down to, like, last week, governments were using torture to try to get people to confess to things or get information from them. So it's not like we can look at them and say, oh, weren't they horrible? Okay. And we do the same thing. I mean, we, yeah, we say we don't torture it, so we, we hand them over to somebody else. Exactly. You know, and, and so, yeah, we have, to, we have to, whenever we're looking at historical things like that, we need to be able to careful that we don't paint them with the colors on our palette when they lived in a very different world, very different time, very different... Now, I'm not saying it's okay. Don't misunderstand me. But the fact is... Um, you know, we, we have to look at history and understand that different, there have been different perspectives down through history. Oh, by the way, we talk about the Spanish Inquisition. The people responsible for that, the people who invited the Inquisition to come there, the people who supported it and maintained it, Ferdinand and Isabella. You recognize those names? Remember what else they did? They sponsored Columbus coming to the New World. Okay. So that's, and that's why Spain ended up owning the New World, is because they sponsored the trips that, that uh, they didn't discover the New World, there were people living here long before that, but the Western Europeans discovered the New World, okay? All right, got one more thing I want to talk about today, and that is the other great schism, <laughs> which is, uh, I want to talk about first what's called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. I've discussed before about the fact that throughout the Western, this is the, it's sometimes called the Western Schism, what I'm, what I'm going to tell you about now. Um, as the Western authorities, that is political authorities, there no longer was a Western emperor. The last one was deposed in 476 by barbarians. 
Without a Western emperor, it ended up that the political authority or the political power fell to whichever barbarian king happened to be strongest until the barbarian kingdom started being uh, converted. And then around 800, Charlemagne, who was Christian, conquered most of Western Europe and turned it all into one big, you know, big Christian kingdom. And he did convert people by force. Um, the idea during that time was after Charlemagne, there was this always this seesaw, actually before Charlemagne and after Charlemagne. Uh, is that some, one of our people doing something? Oh, they're it's pulling the out the door next door. Sorry. Um, there was always this seesaw between is the Pope the spiritual leader of the Western world, the, the real authority, or is it whichever king has political power and an army? And sometimes the popes made, had their own armies, by the way. Um, and it, which is it? And it varied from, you know, depending upon who was in power. Well, the further along we get, we get up to the 13th century, and this becomes a huge deal. And remember that the conflict between secular and religious authorities frequently was over who controlled the property and the money that the church owned. Okay? Because people would give, in order to try to win grace with God, they would give property, they would will property to the church. So that in many places, the episcopacies, which means the episcopal uh, diocese, the, the area, the land that the bishop controlled, would be huge and would be wealthy and would produce a lot of money. Okay? And so everybody wanted some of that, including the kings. So in 1296, there is a huge conflict between Boniface VIII, the Pope, and Philip IV of France over taxation of church property, and also who's in charge here? Um, who, is, who is the secular authority or the religious authority on top? Um, Philip IV, who was a very strong ruler, this was a, this was a time of fairly strong leaders in, in France, he was fighting a war against England, which shortly after this, like 40 years after this, would turn into the 100 years war. You know, from the early 1300s to the mid-1400s was what's called the 100 years war. It really is a series of a bunch of wars between England and France. Partly because after the Norman conquest, the Norman conquest was with uh, the Norman Frenchmen. Again, they didn't call it French back then. There, were, there was Normandy and there was Provence and there was all these different provinces. But the Norman king, the conqueror conquered England. Well, that got everything confused because after that, who has the right <coughs> to be the king of France? Is it the king of England who is descended from, you know, from uh, William the Conqueror? Or is it somebody else who still lives in France and speaks French? And so there's this battle. And the Hundred Years' War, to a great extent, was a, a battle over who has the right to the throne of France since the kings of England were descended from William the Conqueror, who was French, Norman, okay? Um, so, at this time, there already are minor battles going on between the French and the English, and Philip IV of France is looking for some way to raise more money to support his armies. And so, he's looking around and goes, who's got the most money? The church! So he started demanding that the church, you know, pay taxes. And he demanded it. Well, Boniface said, you can't do that, and if you proceed, you'll be excommunicated. And, uh, and so, Philip said, fine, then no money, no coin, no gold, no silver, no anything valuable, leaves France to come to Rome, which cut off a major source of income for Rome. And it's back and forth and back and forth, this huge fight, okay? So, everybody's getting tired of this fight. Everybody is getting tired of battling the French king and the pope. Boniface VIII dies. And in order for the cardinals to try to put an end to this conflict, which is really hurting everybody, they decide they're going to elect a Frenchman to the papacy. So they elect a Frenchman who takes the name Clement V in 1305. But he decides he doesn't want to live in Rome. He decides he wants to live in France because he's French. <laughs> So he, does, he never even comes to Rome. He stays in France, and four years after being elected, he, he orders the whole papal court, all of the records, all of the cardinals, all the everybody, to move to Avignon in France. And if you go there today, you'll see um, the Chateauneuf de Pop, the new house of the popes in Avignon. There's a wine called Chateauneuf de Pop that comes from that area. Okay? So, um, 
The papacy is now in France with a French pope. Over the next 67 years, there are seven successive popes, all of them French, because with the French pope, Clement V, on, living in France, the French king is in complete control of the papacy and in complete control of the cardinals, most of whom, when it comes time to replace them, get replaced with French cardinals. You know, it's the papacy with a French accent. 67 years, seven successive popes, all of them French, all of them reign from Avignon, not from Rome. This is called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Now, later on, Martin Luther writes a book called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. That's a different thing. That's not this, okay? It's, he's talking about the, just the, the decline of the Catholic Church, but he's not talking about this historical incident. So, and during this time, the papacy comes more and more under the influence of the French crown. Generally, it declines in ethics. Now, there are one or two of these popes, and I'm going to give you a list of them in a minute because I want to show you a diagram. Uh, one or two of these popes, I think we're really trying, but they got addicted because when we say that it was coming more and more under the influence of the French crown, they started running the papal court like the royal court of the French king. Huge banquets, silver plates, now golden plates, and silverware. Sumptuous, I mean, there were a couple of these popes that had a reputation for spending more money on clothes than most small countries could run on. Uh, rank nepotism. Every cardinal that got named for a period of time was, was related to the pope. Um, selling simony, the selling of episcopal positions for, to the highest bidder. It got pretty bad. And in fact, because of that, there was a, a decline in um, credibility across all of Europe because of low ethics, low spirituality, you know, just really awful stuff. Well, finally, in 1376, after 60, the 67 years after 1309, which is when the court moved there, it's longer than that since... Uh, since Clement V decided not to move to, to Rome. In 1376, Pope Gregory XI, who was encouraged by Catherine of Siena, St. Catherine, if you go to Siena today in the cathedral, you will see um, her head and one finger bone. The rest of her got moved somewhere else because bones of saints were very valuable. Catherine of Siena, who was known as a preacher and a spiritual woman, she starts working on Gregory and says, you can't continue. The church is dying here. You've got to do something. You have the right, the power, to fix this. She finally convinces Gregory XI to move back to Rome, so he moves back to Rome. Well, one of the, th one of the problems that, that they had had for a long time was before, um, before all this happened, is that the Roman families, very wealthy Roman families, had controlled the papacy. You know? And it went from that to the French ruler, the French king, controlling the papacy. So it moves back to Rome. Gregory, at one point, is so discouraged, he almost leaves again. He decides to stick around. They then, uh, when Gregory XI dies, they uh, select a successor, Urban VI. Now, the Roman families, who, who along with everybody else, has been tired of this French thing going on, they say you have to elect a Roman. Well, they can't find a Roman, so they elect a, a Neapolitan. He's from Naples. And he takes the name Urban VI. He's elected duly, but... They thought he was a good guy. He had seemed to be an able administrator of the church before that, but as soon as they elect him, the guy starts acting wacky. He starts, you know, uh, accusing everybody in his court of simony, accusing people of stealing, all kinds of stuff. So much so that the cardinals who had just elected him leave Rome. And, and I'll, I'll pick this up in a minute. It ends up starting what's called... The, great, the second great schism or the western schism. Barbara, first. Well, wasn't it during all of those French popes that Rome said enough that they elect the Council of Bishops, elect uh -huh. Roman? You're getting ahead of us. No, that oh, has okay. not happened. That did not happen during the first Avignon. Okay. You're actually getting to the great schism, which is okay. I'm about to talk about. All right. You're right, but you're just you're one generation ahead. Okay. Uh, Becky? Oh, I was just wondering what the simony was. With the what? Simony. simony. Oh, simony, you'll remember, is selling a church position. It's named from Simon the Magician in, uh, in the book of Acts, who offers to pay the apostles if they'll teach him how to do the miracles they're doing. 
So simony is the selling of a religious position. And that was one of the great problems that the church had. Okay, so this is where we are. You had Boniface VIII, who had the conflict with the French uh, king. Then we had a short, um, a short reign of a new pope, Benedict XI, who was trying to solve things, couldn't. Then you get all of the popes who are French who live in Avignon. Clement V, John XXII, Benedict XII, Clement VI, Innocent VI, Urban V, and Gregory XI. Then Gregory XI moves back to Rome. See, this is Rome, Avignon. Gregory XI moves back to Rome. It's hard. He's having trouble. He's being pressured by the Roman, rich Roman families to side with Rome against everybody else. Well, he dies in 1378. They elect Urban VI. Urban is kind of a nut job, it turns out. In fact, his own cardinals can't stand it. He's, he's irrational almost. So, after um, Urban the Eleventh is elected, or Urban the Sixth is elected, he's so difficult the cardinals who elected him regret it. A majority of them leave Rome for the city of Anagni. In Anagni, those same cardinals that elected Urban the Sixth elect a new pope, Clement the Seventh. And Clement the Seventh goes, of course, to the other place that was set up to take care of a pope, Avignon. He's ruling from Avignon, while Urban the Sixth is still ruling from Rome. You have two popes. Now, this is not the first time you had more than one person claiming to be pope. But in every other instance, there was one that had been elected duly by the cardinals of the church, and there was one who was just a false claimant. Now you have two popes that were elected by the same cardinals. Same guy, same church leaders elected two different popes. Who's in charge here? Then, Urban VI dies in 1389, and he's replaced by Boniface IX. And the reason he's replaced is because when all these cardinals ran off to Anagni, and then Avignon, Urban appointed his own new cardinals. So now you've got two popes and two sets of cardinals. <laughs> and all along this way, people kept saying, we need to, get, we need to call a new church council. Well, the problem was, uh, according to the laws of the church, only a pope could call a church council. Yeah. <laughs> so then, Clement VII, who was the Avignon Pope, dies in 1394, and his cardinals elect Benedict XIII as his successor in Avignon. Then, Boniface IX dies in Rome, 1404, and his cardinals reluctantly, I say, elect Innocent VII, who lives two years and is replaced by Gregory XII. Now, I say reluctantly, because when Boniface died, the cardinals in Rome say, oh, guys, we've got to stop this. And so they approach Benedict XIII and say, if you will resign, we'll all get together and elect a new pope. Boniface refuses to resign, and they say, well, if we don't have a pope in Rome, then Avignon wins. You can't have that. So they elect their own pope, Innocent VII. Well, all of this got so frustrating that the bishops around the Catholic Church said, we've got to have a council. And if they even got the church lawyers, the canon lawyers, to get together and say, okay, since a pope is supposed to call a council, what right? And they finally said, in the interest of survival, the, the laws of the church allow the bishops to call. And so they call the Council of Pisa. Council of Pisa meets in 1409 to resolve the schism. They depose both Benedict and Gregory, neither one of which is willing to go. And they elect Alexander V who dies shortly after and is followed by John the 23rd. But since the other two won't step down, you know, have three popes. <laughs> if it wasn't so sad, you know. You can't then, make this stuff up. With all, yeah, you can't make this up. With all of this going on, finally, the church calls another council in 1414, the Council of Constance. They get two of the popes, that is, Gregory and Alexander V, they get them to agree to resign for the interest of the church. Benedict refuses to resign, so they excommunicate him and depose him. They elect Martin V. See, the difference here is they got the, the two of the three popes to resign before they tried to elect a new pope. And the third one who refused, they took action against him. And then they elected Martin V, and the schism finally is resolved. Now, Benedict continued for a long time claiming to be Pope. But, you know, it's, it's like there were four people who were following him at that point. Nobody ever cared. Yes, Ron? I have two quick questions. Okay. Is this on the exam? Oh, okay. <laughs>
Uh, uh, secondly, the, the name John the 23rd sounds familiar. Actually, yeah, I said this earlier. Um, this John the 23rd, because he was asked to resign, um, was not, is not counted in the line of popes, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. Okay? There was another John the 23rd who was an anti-pope. That's what they call somebody who claims to be pope but isn't an anti-pope. And his name was not counted. So, when you get into the 20th century, John the 23rd was the pope they called the Second Vatican Council. So there have been three supposed popes. Two of them were discounted because they were either anti-popes or they resigned right away during this whole mess of the schism. Uh, and so that's why John the 23rd's name was still available. He couldn't skip to John the 24th because technically there hadn't been a John the 23rd who was pope. Okay, yes? How did they get those numbers? You know, George... Gregory the Because the, 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 Gregory the Twelfth, there had been 11 before him. Uh -huh. There had been a lot of popes. And they would claim. Now, Pope Francis that we have right now, the first one ever named Francis. So he is just Pope Francis. John Paul, there was nobody named John Paul, so he was the first. But when he died shortly after, and there was a second one who took the name John Paul, he's John Paul II. Yeah, the and, back of the book has yeah, all the lists. Look at the back of the book. It's got all of that stuff. Oh. And also it's got all of the events that are dealt with in the councils, I think, too. Yes, Bob. This would make a really great reality TV show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think, I think it has been. There, there are a number of movies about this and stuff. But when you, when you look at all these shenanigans that went on, it's no wonder that modern Europe is so secular. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's it. The church suffered horribly under this. Okay, this is what you've seen so far. We get to Urban VI in 1378. His, his cardinals run away and elect uh, Clement VII, who's in Avignon. And then when Urban dies, they elect Boniface in Rome. Um, when Clement VII dies, they elect Benedict the Thirteenth. Now, later on, he's excommunicated, but that doesn't come for 20 years. Then, Innocent the Seventh and Gregory the Twelfth are uh, come along after Boniface. And again, Gregory the Twelfth resigns, but not till not till later. Alexander the Fifth is elected by Council of Pisa, but Gregory and Benedict don't step down at that point. So we got three popes. Perfect. Then John the 20, uh, 23rd, and then finally the Council of Constance convinces uh, John the 23rd to resign and Gregory to resign. They excommunicate Benedict the 13th, and they elect Martin the 5th. And, the and Martin the 5th is in Rome? Yes. Yeah. And was he a good pope? Um, I'd have to go back and look. Huh. You know, two popes in a pod. They all run together <laughs> after a while. I, 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 can't, I don't know of anything particular about him, and I'd have to go back and look. Other than, Gregory, uh, other than Pope Gregory. The yeah, Gregory. I mean, there are some that I know about, you know, particulars that stand out, but uh, in terms of the long line, I don't know. So this gives you an idea. Any questions about that? None of those uh, popes in Avignon seem to have French names. Oh, they yeah. all took, they all took, you notice that none of them are the once, the first. They all take names from some predecessor. And those predecessors, almost all, you know, were not French. French popes didn't come along. So, the, the idea, you know, Clement was a name in the early, uh, in the Apostolic Fathers, and some of the others came along, John, obviously, um, and so, yeah, they take those names, it doesn't really matter what country they're coming from, those names existed before that country had, had a pole. Becky, first, and Joey. I was wondering, when all this was going on, we had great thoughts tonight, what, what were the, like, comments of the people and the, the kings and... Oh, they hated it. I mean, the French king was the only one... Well, it lost so much credibility, and that's why the church council started. In fact, this is called the councilor movement, where for a period of time, the councils of the church took authority over the pope, rather than the other way around. Remember, that technically, the law of the church had said that only a pope can call a council. Later on, this councilor movement said that a council of the church can depose a pope. That didn't last very long. Very shortly after Martin V, in fact, it may have been Martin V, I'll have to go back and look, the Pope reasserted his authority and said, no, 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 you, you, the councils, and so the council movement went away, and the Popes regained authority, in fact, more so in some cases than before, okay? But that, you need to understand, because this did affect, exactly what the questions you're asking, this did affect the way ordinary people looked at the papacy and the Catholic Church, all right? Joanne, you had a question, and then... Well, yes, how did they pick the name? I mean, did the, the church... The Pope chooses. He just said, that's yeah. the one I want to be. The Pope announces that this is the name I'm taking. When oh. Pope Francis was elected, he said, I will take the name, you know, Pope Francis. Okay. Uh, and so they decide. 
And frequently it's because whoever their predecessor was, the named predecessor, they and somehow benefited from them. They appreciated their theology, they liked what they did, you know, whatever. Yeah. Was it his choice, Francis of Assisi? Exactly. Yeah, yes. he named himself after Francis. Yep. Okay.